uh, Krishnamurti uh, recognizes that thought, uh, rational, orderly, factual thought, uh, such as in proper doing science, is necessary and valuable, but the kind of thought that he has in mind is self-centered thought. That is, uh, now, uh, at first sight, one might wonder why self-centered thought is so bad. If the self were really there, then perhaps it would be correct to center it on the self because the self would be so important. But if the self is a kind of illusion, at least the self as we know it, then to center our thought on something uh, illusory, which is assumed to have supreme importance, is going to disrupt the whole process. And it will not only make thought about yourself wrong, it will make thought about everything wrong, so that thought becomes a, a dangerous and destructive instrument all around. Because this uh, illusory self, uh, which is really an image, is regarded as all important, whenever anything about it is, appears to be threatened, the brain develops a very powerful defense mechanism uh, uh, to try to prevent this from taking place. Uh, you can see this in an elementary way. If somebody says you're an idiot, the image of yourself as an idiot is painful, and there's an automatic response to uh, uh, accept uh, assumptions of, uh, proving you're not an idiot, and somebody else is an idiot. And, and, but that's a minor point. The major point is that if somebody says something which threatens the reality of this whole structure itself, then it's as if your life were at stake. The brain, all, all stops are pulled out, and the brain responds, you know, with the instinct of self-preservation to absolutely prevent you from considering it. I, it may just uh, dull the mind or transfer attention somewhere else or make you forget about it or make you find yourself thinking of something else, any number of defenses. And you see, it's clear that when somebody like Krishnamurti comes along and says that this uh, is an illusion or this isn't uh, real, that th this defense mechanism is going to be provoked into action. And, and uh, this then becomes the principal difficulty in listening to the communication. Part of the defense is to make us unconscious of it. You see, part of the major form of defense is simply concealment of what's going on, because if we could see what's going on, it would be obvious it's an illusion. It's like seeing through the trick of the magician. So uh, also, uh, all the ways I've described, such as forgetting and zapping your mind or jumping to something else, are modes of concealment. You may also conceal by just d denying that it's so and asserting something else. And... Uh, Therefore, we are not conscious uh, either of, we are not conscious certainly of the defense mechanism because th this process of concealment itself has to be concealed in order to make it effective. And therefore, the, uh, the defense, the major part of the defense consists in making the whole process unconscious. We're well, Krishnamurti is suggesting, proposing, even saying that the self is not the source of thought, but rather thought is the source of the self. Now, uh, that may seem paradoxical to our ordinary experience, but it, at least we can make it reasonable. You see, uh, if uh, we're saying that the assumption of the self creates uh, inside a kind of image of the self uh, corresponding to that assumption with, with great power, and that image is attributed reality, and you get a feeling that it's real, therefore you, you form the assumption that there is the, the self who is the thinker, the source of thought, and there is that which he is thinking about, and besides that there is the thought which is produced by the thinker, which refers to what he is thinking about. Eh? Now, therefore, the things which really are solidly existent in that view are the thinker and what he is thinking about. Thought is a very ethereal, almost non-existent thing. But uh, what, what is being suggested instead is that the thought process is real. It's going on in the brain and nervous system. And this thought process contains in it the assumption of a thinker who produces thought. So it's as, a, as it were producing a television program of a thinker producing thought, and the, and the mind is watching that program so intently that it takes that to be the reality. <laughs> and then, therefore, thought now says, I am very modest, I am serving the thinker, but in fact it's serving itself because it, it is always, it, it produces this thinker and then <laughs> and then does what this thinker wants. <laughs> Krishnamurti talked a great deal about conditioning, and he admitted that certain kinds of conditioning were necessary, such as learning to do things. Uh, but there's a kind of conditioning around the self which is extremely strong, uh, because it contains assumptions of, uh, of, uh, uh, of absolute necessity. You see, the self is considered to be something supremely important, and whatever it needs is regarded as absolutely necessary, which means that you, uh, it cannot be otherwise, it cannot yield. 
and therefore it takes first priority and it pushes everything aside, including even the requirement that thoughts should be tr correct and true. <laughs> and therefore it immediately starts self-deception going. And that is why thought becomes dangerous, because if thought deceives itself, it is really very dangerous. Well, I think the ultimate purpose of Kay's work was stated very early in his life, in his work, which was to free humanity from the destructive conditioning we've been talking about. That is, uh, this uh, conditioning around the um, self-centered thought is really an enslavement, enslavement to absurdity, to destruction, to unhappiness, sorrow. And it, no other kind of freedom means anything unless we are free from that. <laughs> And therefore, I think that he felt that once man was free from that, then the room would be, the way would be open to creative uh, unfoldment in all, in all sorts of uh, directions.